Good morning, everyone. Please welcome Samantha McGill to the stage. Good morning, and welcome to day two of AIAA's 2024 SciTech Forum. As the voice of God said, I am Samantha McGill, Business Development Manager at the Aeronautics Research Directorate at NASA Langley. It's my pleasure to serve on the SciTech Go Guiding Coalition again this year. I'd also like to welcome our live stream audience. We're glad they can join us online and experience today's plenary session. So to begin the morning, we celebrate our award recipients as we will do each morning. So I'd like to invite Martiqua Post, the Aerospace Sciences Group Director, and Jeanette Dunbar, the Aerospace Design and Structures Group Director, to the stage to help present these awards. All right, it's my pleasure to begin announcing the 2024 AIAA Aerodynamic Measurement Technology Award. This award is presented for continued contributions and achievements toward the advancement of advanced aerodynamics, flow field, and structure measurement techniques for research and flight and ground test applications. The AIAA 2024 Aerodynamic Measurement Technology Award is presented to Paul M. Danahy from NASA Langley Research Center. Thy citation reads, for the development and application of optical and laser-based measurement techniques supporting NASA's aeronautics and space exploration missions. Congratulations to my colleague, Paul. <laughs> Next, the AIAA Mechanics and Control of Flight Award. This recognizes an outstanding recent technical or scientific contribution by an individual and the mechanics, guidance, or control of flight in the space or atmosphere. The 2024 AIAA Mechanics and Control of Flight Award is presented to David Mitchell. He is from the Mitchell Aerospace Research Group, and the award citation reads for industry-defining research and globally recognized leadership in flying qualities handling qualities, and PIO evaluation in both fixed-wing and rotary ring vehicles. Congratulations, David. <laughs> Next is the AIAA Structures, Structural Dynamics, and Materials Award. This award recognizes an individual has been responsible for an outstanding sustained technical or scientific contribution in aerospace structures, structural dynamics, or materials. The 2024 AIAA Structures, Structural Dynamics, and Materials Award is presented to Carlos E. S. Sesnick of the University of Michigan. The citation reads, for the seminal contributions to research and education and structural modeling, dynamics, and health monitoring, emphasizing multi-physic effects in very flexible aircraft, rotorcraft, and hypersonic vehicles. Congratulations, Carlos. Thank you. Next, the AIAA Survivability Award recognizes an individual or a team for outstanding achievement or contribution in design, analysis, implementation, and or education of survivability in an aerospace system. The 2024 AIAA Survivability Award is presented to Gary C. Woolenweber of GE Aerospace. This award citation reads for the exceptional leadership, professional excellence, technical prominence, and ethical conduct in the pursuit of aircraft survivability technologies. Congratulations, Gary. Finally for this morning, we have the AIAA Duff Lorenz Award for Flight Simulation. It recognizes an outstanding individual achievement in the application of flight simulation to aerospace training, research, and development. The AIAA 2024 Duff Lorenz Award for Flight Simulation is presented to Marinas Maria Van Passen of Delft University. 
The award, yes. Unfortunately, Marinas couldn't be here today, but we will make sure that he receives this award. His citation reads, for key contributions to the fields of human-in-the-loop vehicle simulation, real-time and distributed simulation software, and human factors. Congratulations to all our award recipients this morning. If you are interested in the awards program and you'd like to learn more, the Honors and Awards Committee is hosting a special workshop today. They'll discuss not only awards, but member upgrades, processes and policies, and how even to write an award-winning nomination. Could be good for a lot of things. Join them today at 2 p.m. Shifting to today's activities. So before we get to the schedule highlights, uh, I am from NASA Langley, so I wanted to note that we have a photo opportunity for all of my NASA colleagues, of one NASA photo um, directly after this session. You'll go out, take a right and a right. It'll be in front of the Regency Ballroom R and S. Ceremony near the uh, expo hall. So just keep going directly there. Don't pass go. And uh, we'll have a nice photo for everyone. We are looking forward to the exposition hall opening today. It's filled with a range of transformative technologies and solutions from a record breaking 80, more than 80 leading companies. In fact, it's totally sold out. You'll see some of the kiosk exhibits added around the entrance. Uh, so many of these exhibitors are also looking for top talent. Um, not only do they have cool things going on, but they're looking for talent, so go check it out. Uh, you can also visit the Hub to hear short talks on the innovation stage that's located in the Expo Hall, and those will begin at 1. As we begin the program this morning, we remember our theme this week, Outside In, Expand the Boundaries. When the Guiding Coalition considered what we should cover for each day, which was a fun group of folks I worked with, we wanted one day to focus on the future of flight, and that's today. We have two panels that will consider a systems view of sustainability and the disruptive technologies that are changing how we design, build, fuel, and operate flying vehicles for the future. We begin this action-packed day with a fireside chat. They'll discuss the future of flight. Our moderator is Dr. Juan Alonso. He's professor and department chair of the aeronautics and astronautics at Stanford University. He's the founder and director of the Aerospace Design Laboratory, where he specializes in computational design methodologies. His research involves both crewed and uncrewed applications to include transonic, supersonic, hypersonic aircraft, as well as helicopters, turbine machinery, launch and reentry vehicles. He's done it all. Um, he's a, also a member of a team that currently holds the world speed record for human powered flight over water. And one of his student teams also holds the altitude record for an uncrewed electric vehicle over five, under five pounds. So, I think you'll agree that we couldn't find a better moderator for today's fireside chat. So I'd like to invite Juan and our two speakers, Dr. Ken Plax and Rami Murad, to join us on the stage. And as they're joining us on the stage, I'll remind the audience uh, we'll have the QR code up there and you can scan that to get to the uh, Q&A. So please join us. And good morning, everyone. Welcome to a, an open-ended session on the future of flight. Uh, this is a, a session where we're going to try to explore the challenges and opportunities of flight, broadly defined to include both atmospheric and transatmospheric flight. So I, I think we're fortunate to live in a time where these challenges and opportunities abound. But the very nature of the challenges and the opportunities is such that they're interdisciplinary which means there's going to be additional requirements for integration and the ever presence of the requirement for absolute safety. So how will we tackle these challenges is, is of paramount importance. I, I think many of us, or at least the panelists, but many, many of you in the audience also would agree that there's a strong sense that there is an unmistakable acceleration of the pace of technology. And somehow we have to integrate all contributions from various different places in order to make headway in advancing the future of flight, which will be the subject of today's discussion. So, so I'd like to start the panel by talking about three critical challenges, which I'll pose to the panelists, but also to you as a question that I personally think are sort of the, the guiding challenges for the future of flight for the next 20 years. So challenge number one is sustainability. How will we continue to grow the aerospace system? and at the same time, eliminate or minimize the environmental impacts. 
uh, said in another way, how will we get to a commercial air transportation in 2050 that actually has zero emissions? You know, there are many ingredients to this particular challenge, some of which we will discuss. And I, I will tell you that electrification is one of them, which 15 years ago was a pipe dream. And now it's much better understood and has generated billions of dollars in investments. So sustainability is challenge number one. Challenge number two revolves around autonomy and AI. How will autonomy and AI impact the types of flight systems that we're going to be developing over the next few years, over the next 10, 20 years? So from perception to decision making, to coordination, to networks, to position navigation and time and the security of those PNT signals, <clears throat> and not least of all, to AI safety and verifiability. How will all those technologies play into aviation and AI in order to produce future flight systems? And challenge number three for me is new entrants and new capabilities. How will we satisfy the demands of society from the flight point of view? Will it be EV tolls? Will it be drones? Will it be commercial transports of fast, uh, sorry, far higher efficiency. We'll be talking about supersonics, hypersonics, new military missions, new storage and propulsion systems, new materials. And, and how will we deal with the uh, ever increasing explosion of sens sensor data and, and AI, of course. So, so all of those are challenges that we are fortunate today to have two incredible panelists with a lot of experience in these different topics. And I, I, it's a real pleasure to have sort of collaborated with them in preparing this session. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing what they have to say. So let me introduce them to you. And I will try to make this short so we can get to the, uh, the discussion topic. So to my left is Rami Murad, who serves as Boeing Director of Engineering for Urban Air Mobility. This is a position he's held since October 2021. Nearly 20 uh, years of experience dedicated to advancing commercial and defense aerospace. Uh, and he is obviously a leader and an innovator in this transformative subject. So in his current role, um, he heads Boeing's UAM engineering collaborations with industry leaders, Whisk Aero and Skygrid. His team is actively designing and building one of the world's first certified commercial autonomous electric aircraft. So, Prior to this role, uh, Rami held essential positions at Boeing, including the director of the Northwest Lab Test and Evaluation and the director of the new uh, mid-market airplane NMA test program. So he's an aviation enthusiast and a pilot, um, and he's had lots of other roles, including at Honda Aircraft and Eclipse Aviation. So thank you for joining us today, Rami. To my left uh, is uh, Ken Plax, who is the director of DARPA's Tactical Technology Office, a role he assumed in June 2023. He's previously served as the director of the agency's Adaptive Capabilities Office, where he managed several highly collaborative efforts to create new joint warfighting constructs and doctrine. He has served as deputy director of DARPA's Strategic Technology Office, and from December 21 to February 22, also served as the acting director of that office. His interests include stealth aircraft, electronic warfare, weapons research, and cybersecurity. Um, he has a bachelor's degree in physics and mathematics uh, from various different universities and a PhD uh, in physics as well. So I'm going to invite the two panelists to make some introductory remarks to set the stage for the context that we are discussing here, the future of flight. And we're going to start with Rami. So Rami, would you like to take it away? Hey, thanks, Juan. Wow, what an event and uh, what a time to be in aerospace. Uh, incredible, like you said, an amount of innovation. Uh, I actually, because it's relevant to the conversation today, I want to acknowledge last week's uh, safety event with uh, Alaska. Uh, Boeing, on behalf of Boeing, is uh, deeply regretful of the, uh, the impact it's had on our customers and passengers uh, and is working closely with the uh, FAA, fully supports the uh, NTSB activities going on uh, on the follow-up events there and next steps. Um, but because uh, it's... You know, we, we, have, we take these events very, very seriously, these safety events very, very seriously. In the context of the conversation today uh, regarding the future of flight, it's important to acknowledge that historically, we've faced into these safety events uh, many times, and that's what's allowed us to really expand the, the scale of our industry. And it's the foundation, that, that mindset and focus on safety is a foundation for that, that innovation and growth that uh, we've experienced and, and for the future going forward. 
Um, but I, so to transition over, I want to say something that sounds maybe a little bit cliche, but I sincerely believe this is a generational moment uh, when you zoom out and take a look at aviation history uh, for us right now. I think that it's going to liken back to the early days uh, of aerospace. Imagine if you're a child in 1903 when the Wright Flyer took flight for the very first time, what you would have seen uh, in your lifetime. In, that sh in 66 years, you would have seen everything from that very first flight, fabric and wood aircraft, mm -hmm. to landing a human on the moon and returning them safely to Earth uh, and everything in between. I think that's a remarkable amount of, uh, an amazing amount of innovation that's happened in a short amount of time. And I think we're about to see that rate of innovation again. Since the 70s until today, we've scaled our industry to incredible proportions. So right before COVID in 2019, we, we moved uh, 4.5 billion passengers uh, around the world. And we're about to do that again this year. We predict uh, uh, actually surpass that for the first time since COVID. Uh, and at an, at really at an impeccable safety record uh, across our industry. This safety is the foundation for our next wave of innovation. This, that, that's such a key piece of it. But there's a few other enablers that I think are, are really converging to help us create this next wave. Uh, so the, of course, business models and consumer trends are helping us uh, see the world a little bit differently. We're engaging societal norms. We're engaging with technologies more rapidly. You can see uh, people just engaging with electric vehicles, autonomy in their vehicles, uh, generative AI on a daily basis now. Uh, market, business markets, business models are changing with uh, things like the, uh, the onset of ride share. Um, but sustainability, like you mentioned, Juan, is, uh, is a globally understood, committed responsibility across all industries that I think is going to drive a lot of innovation. Um, all that to say, now that technologies have matured to a point where we can, across industries, uh, accelerate the application into, uh, from other industries, even into, uh, into aerospace. Uh, digital engineering, we were talking about this a little bit last night, is allowing us to develop and verify and, and validate technologies faster in digital models with very advanced simulation capabilities. Electrification, like the, the WISC aircraft you see behind me, uh, another eVTOL is allowing us to rethink aircraft configurations in a whole new way. We, we can put 12 lifting fans on an aircraft configuration now without uh, a whole bunch of gearboxes and transmissions. And that allows us to have a lot more safety and redundancy with just running high voltage um, wire from the battery to the motors versus all the, uh, the mechanical systems. And that gives us uh, opportunity to come up with these new advanced uh, and very different configurations. But I think autonomy is going to be a key. I think autonomy is going to be a theme for the next century uh, of, of aerospace development that's going to allow us to safely scale uh, in different ways, in ways that we haven't even imagined yet. Uh, so like the early days of aerospace, uh, I don't think someone in 1903 could have imagined sending someone to the moon and back in their lifetime. I think we're going to have, at this moment in time, uh, maybe some of you have, uh, have, have a vision for 66 years what we might imagine, but I think it might be hard for us to, to even predict what we're about to see with the convergence of these events. So the Boeing portfolio, uh, just a few examples behind me, the X-66, the X-65, is, uh, and of course WISC is uh, really leaning into these, these enablers and, uh, and game changers, and I'm pretty excited to see what, we, what we're about to build. Great. Thank you for those intro comments, uh, Rami. So I'm going to turn it over to Ken for his perspective also on the future of flight. Uh, thanks. Um, so I'm going to kind of focus more on the military side of the, uh, of, of the question. And if you were to try to figure out, you know, in the past what was coming in the military, looking at what DARPA was doing is usually a good way to kind of figure out what's coming. You know, the, certainly the mission of DARPA is trying to figure out what's next. Uh, so just, uh, you know, a couple of smattering. There's a whole bunch of these uh, you know, that I could have put on the chart. Uh, things like Have Blue, the, the prototype for the stealth fighter. Uh, uh, interestingly, m when DARPA was doing that, a significant fraction of the Air Force uh, was like, why would we want to be invisible? We just need a bigger jammer, right? And, and, and uh, uh, you know, so they didn't even, 
you know, the, a lot of times the military acquisition system, the big acquisition system that involves Boeing and such is we'll write requirements and, and, and then tell you what we want and we'll try to imagine what the world's going to be like in 20 or 30 years and, and then we write requirements of what we think we want. And then, of course, we're wrong about what the world looks like and, and what we want changes, which causes things to drag out. And it, it's a really big, complicated thing. And, and, uh, um, and I'll talk about this a little later, but you know, part of, I think, what we need to do, you know, the, the defense industry uh, on the aviation side has really collapsed, not collapsed, co consolidated um, uh, to an extraordinary degree where you've basically got Boeing, Lockheed, and Northrop that can build airplanes. There are, you know, niche airplanes that done by other folks. Um, and then there's this gigantic ecosystem of innovators uh, that are coming. And, and uh, um, the, the, the question is, how do we harness that? And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later, uh, about things we're doing, at least at DARPA, to try to harness some of that innovation. You know, it, it, it's a little anticlimactic if you ever come to DARPA and, and visit. It's, it's just an office building. We don't have labs, and you know, we don't have aliens in the basement or anything like that. And, and uh, uh, a, a lot of what uh, being a DARPA PM is, uh, program manager is, 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 is really like leading your community. Uh, so, you know, the folks that, that I have doing aviation now, like Rich Wellesley, who's leading the X-65, uh, uh, or Tabitha Dodson, who, who's leading the Draco uh, nuclear thermal rocket program, you know, they're actually not in their office creating, you know, additive manufactured rocket parts. That, that's not what they're doing. You know, they're actually leading large teams of people across the nation trying to accomplish things. Um, so, you know, again, you can see some of the things we've done with, you know, Global Hawk was kind of a, a, a play. You're seeing the results of Global Hawk, a completely autonomous. Predator could be on here too. That actually started as a DARPA program. Uh, what we've done in space. Uh, interestingly, you know, like Falcon 9 is, is a fantastic rocket. Falcon 1 was a DARPA program, you know, a, a long time ago. Um, uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So if you want to know what's coming, this is what we're doing, a, a sampling of what we're doing now. Uh, the active flow control, uh, the idea that you could fly without actually having moving control surfaces. You know, even the Wright brothers were warping their wings, right? Uh, um, you know, that obviously has implications for Signature and other things if we can get it to work, uh, working with Boeing and, and, and Aurora Flight Sciences. Um, I talked about consolidation. You know, Boeing, I think, with Aurora at least, is doing a, a, a good job of not smothering the baby, uh, you know, with, with care. Uh, it, it's hard for a big company to absorb a small company and allow the small company to keep its small company mojo. Uh, you know, sometimes they get, you know, tied up in, in, in just the bigness. Uh, uh, Aurora uh, seems to kind of be holding on to it, and, 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 uh, but reaching deep into Boeing for talent and expertise uh, where, where required. So they're doing a good job. Um, so I'm complimenting a major defense contract that, that doesn't happen often. Um, but, uh, 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 Longshot is a uh, kind of an autonomous vehicle that can d deploy air-to-air -air missiles well forward of the launching aircraft. So again, you've got autonomy and, and kind of smallness and cheapness. Those are things that we're working on. Um, uh, Rima is trying to figure out how to, you know, take what's happening in Ukraine and take it to the next level of adding autonomy to things that were not really designed to be autonomous. Uh, Liberty Lifter is going to be another X-plane when we build it. And this is a C-130 sized uh, seaplane that can actually get up out of ground effect. It cruises in ground effect and you save the 30% drag. Uh, so kind of you know, some of the cargo capacity of a, of a small ship, but the speed of an airplane. 
uh, as the United States pivots to the Pacific, uh, you know, distance becomes a big thing. You know, the Army, the Marines, the Air Force are all talking about playing shell games on the islands. But if you're tethered to a runway, it's not too hard to figure out. Or just take out the, uh, the, the runways, and it doesn't matter where on the island they are. They can't get supplies. And they're, it's a, it's a, they're mission ineffective. Uh, so Liberty Lifter, excuse me, is a, an attempt to open up all the coasts of all the islands in the, in the Pacific. And interestingly, we're, you know, that wasn't hard enough uh, at Starpa, right? Um, so we're building it the way you build a boat, not the way you build an airplane. Uh, it turns out, if you look at the price per pound of an airplane versus the price per pound of a boat, there's an order of magnitude or two difference. It's significantly cheaper to build a boat. Things like, you know, aircraft aluminum, you, you can't weld, right? You gotta, you gotta rim it, whereas you can weld and repair boat aluminum, maritime aluminum. Um, so the, 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 the lead on that program is actually a naval architect, not an aerodynamicist. Uh, and so he, he's used to a much denser fluid. Uh, and then, you know, I, I guess I, I kind of talked a little bit about Draco, a nuclear thermal rocket. You know, I, a, as we get further and start doing things and commercializing space, you need not just efficiency, but actual thrust, you know, magnitude. Uh, and so that is a good compromise getting you both. Uh, there's other stuff going on uh, that, I, you know, I'm not going to, you know, 30 years ago, I couldn't have told you about the stealth fighter. Uh, uh, and there's stuff I can't tell you about now, but uh, you know that's kind of a smattering of what's coming down the pipe. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ken. Uh, yeah. I really appreciate those comments. Uh, yeah. let, let me just jump into questions directly about the future flight. And I'll remind the audience that periodically you'll see a QR code and a, a website where you can also enter your own questions, which we'll get to in the second half of this panel. But uh, let, let me start with you, Rami, if you don't mind. Uh, um, we're smack in the middle of this advanced air mobility, maybe more specifically urban air mobility movement. Uh, and there have been lots of new entrants recently, including Boeing with the acquisition of WISC. Uh, so what, what do you think is driving all this focus and what role does this movement have in the future of flight? Uh, thanks, Juan. <clears throat> and thank you, Ken, for the, the compliment on the <laughs> integration with, the, with Aurora. I'll tell you, that's actually a, a very key intentional strategy. Aurora is incredible. WISC is incredible, and they're very focused on their, their products. So that one plus one equals three mindset is a really key component uh, in our relationship. From a WISC uh, perspective, we've actually, uh, yeah, we acquired WISC uh, last year, but we've been working with WISC for about uh, five years now, and WISC has been around for 14 years. Uh, they've, they started with this uh, uh, idea around electrification uh, and original pioneers in this space really a, a while back uh, looking at uh, uh, very key milestones. I think what they may have been the first to actually transition uh, an electric takeoff, vertical takeoff to forward wingborne flight. Uh, and over the years have developed these uh, five different generations. Uh, what you see behind me flying is uh, public demonstrations of the Gen 5 aircraft at uh, Oshkosh and uh, and LA, some of the busiest uh, airports or events in the, in the world. We learned a ton from that. And over those five generations, WISC has learned a lot like uh, uh, many of these entrants in, in the eVTOL space, which is, you know, what's driving this? It's a, a compelling, very compelling problem statement that's age old. It's the value of our time as a society. Uh, and uh, how can we reach further? How can we reach uh, where we need to be uh, faster uh, in, in congested environments. And so today, we, uh, as, as a globe, we have 55% of our global population uh, in urban environments. And the UN predicts that by uh, 2050, about 68% will be in urban environments. So this, this compelling problem statement of how do we uh, feasibly, efficiently, safely uh, <coughs> overcome this congestion is, I think, driving a lot of this, uh, this demand. Uh, thinking about how aviation and how air mobility could connect people in a intra-city method uh, in addition to inter-city. Uh, so that, that's really, I think, the, the compelling uh, vision. 
Mm -hmm. And of course, the, uh, the enablers, like we talked about, are really coming together um, to, to incentivize. We see, uh, according to Avweek, uh, about $7 billion, actually $8 billion over the uh, recent years from venture funding has gone into this industry. And we haven't, uh, it's not just the product itself. This is an investment in intellectual capital. All of these people getting smarter will continue to get smart and innovate and um, take that, uh, that learning in, in future applications that we haven't even imagined yet. So it's, it's a pretty exciting time. I think there's a, a compelling vision here. Um, the UAM concept actually isn't all that new. It, it has uh, been attempted in the past, in the 60s, and I think even into the early 70s, uh, with helicopters. But it couldn't take hold at scale. It wasn't accessible uh, because of several, several limiting factors. It was, uh, it, you know, of course, from a community noise perspective, but the reliability and maintainability costs of helicopters and ultimately um, safety at scale for, for transportation became a, uh, uh, a, a, an impediment to, to keep it from scaling. So we believe now that technologies have advanced to the point where we can uh, reach commercial levels of safety. What we have today is we, we as a society take for granted we can get anywhere in the world by getting on an airplane uh, comfortably and safely within a matter of hours. And, uh, and that's a true, true remarkable achievement um, but that public expectation around that commercial level of safety, that's unwavering. Uh, so that, that's, the, that's the foundational piece that we have to design to and, and validate uh, to enable this, this AAM, UAM uh, industry. Uh, but I think the time is now. I think it's, it's really, uh, it's a feasible, we'll start to see entrance uh, uh, very, very soon in the, in the coming a uh, couple years, and then we'll see, uh, I think, scaling of this through mm -hmm. autonomous solutions like we're doing with WISC, uh, we target this decade. Yeah, well, that, I think that's exciting. I, I'm actually gonna try to connect the dots because I enjoy Ken's slides uh, with all the demonstrator programs that you're pursuing and, and you know, you guys doing this in, in UAM as well. So for Ken, what, what are the value to DARPA and, and to the U.S. Department of Defense of, of these demonstrator programs and explain programs that you are supporting quite strongly? So, Yeah, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I kind of alluded to the fact that uh, right now the, the, the military, the, the big military, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. takes, you know, 20 years to d design and build an airplane, right? And they're very conservative. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, they're very conservative, so they are not going to place a, a, a bet on, on an unproven technology right? uh, uh, unless they absolutely have to. Mm -hmm. and, and so frequently what we're doing at DARPA with X-Planes is kind of trying to get through some of the antibodies, you know, in, in the Pentagon and elsewhere that are like, well, you know, why would I want a hybrid electric plane? Gas is great, you know, for instance. Um, and so, uh, and I, you know, we're, we're working a hybrid electric uh, aircraft right now, as a matter of fact. Um, but, you know, the, the value of the X-Plane is to kind of slay the technical dragon and, and, and show that something's possible. Now, there's a, informal logic. You know, there's proof by induction, proof by deduction, and, and proof by one good example, and they're all mathematically equivalent, and, and uh, that's not true. Um, and, and uh, uh, but frequently within the bureaucracy of the federal government, actually having someone actually do, do something like a reusable rocket uh, on, on SpaceX. Now, of course, you want to fly back the booster. Of course, it's doable. Um, uh, and after someone does it for the first time, well, of course, it's possible. Sure. Uh, so, so that's where we tend to do with our X-Planes. We will occasionally do what we call an X-Prime, which is a more missionized, explain, uh, but we, we, we only do that if we're like in partnership with one of the services. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's quite exciting. I, uh, on the topic of autonomy, which will impact explains, but also UAM, and I brought up as one of the challenges that I think we have to face over the next uh, 20 years or so, you, you've been sort of smack in the middle of that as well at, at WISC, uh, and WISC has been outspoken about the fact that UAM to succeed has to enable autonomy uh, from the get-go, essentially. So can you tell us a little bit more about 
why that choice and what are the challenges associated with that particular choice? So. Yeah, thanks, Juan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's, you know, in the, in the UAM space, there's a, a general consensus that ideally we can create a four-person autonomous mm -hmm. uh, electric eVTOL aircraft as, as an ideal state. It's, it's a matter of how do we, how do we get there. Um, and the reason for that is autonomy uh, allows us to scale, mm -hmm. allows us to scale with uh, very carefully uh, designed functional decomposition across the system beyond the aircraft itself. Aerospace allows us, uh, you know, unlike an automotive where you're basically making decisions within the, the vehicle itself, uh, the, all the behavior management from the sensors on board, we have a very highly connected aerospace uh, system today, well beyond the aircraft. And so uh, the technologies for autonomy, they exist today. In fact, it, it, autonomy has been around for decades and, you know, it's, as Ken was mentioning, uh, and some of the examples we see up on, uh, on the slides, uh, defense has really leaned, in, leaned into autonomous solutions over the past several decades. Going forward, I think we're gonna start to see autonomy uh, make its way into the commercial space uh, a lot more because of the benefits that we've developed and noticed. Now it's a matter of pulling these proven technologies in a way that from an end-to-end -end, uh, system decomposition, we have um, demonstrated that commercial level of safety all the way through. When we talk about autonomy in UAM, we're not talking about pulling people out of the loop. Mm -hmm. It's not this idea where we have this AI system making the entire, all the decisions on its own without humans. The people still have a very critical role on, on the ground. And, uh, and human judgment continues to play a very, very important role in the operations. What we're talking about is uh, an aircraft taking off from a known specific controlled location, mm -hmm. flying a pre-planned flight plan, a pre-planned flight path, all the way through to landing at another known specific controlled location. And everything in between is understood, and even including the uh, potential contingency landing zones if we needed to in a, in a, uh, a off nominal condition uh, or emergency situation. And all of that, uh, basically A to B to A to B uh, operation is boring in an elegant way, uh, on purpose. Uh, and, and that's what allows it. This isn't about um, machine learning or uh, generative AI deciding what the airplane's gonna do. It's a very deterministic system. Everything from the onboard systems to that connectivity. So we documented what, what this concept ought to look like uh, with WISC and, and Boeing um, and Aurora Flight Sciences together last two years ago in 2022 um, and put it out there. Hey, what does this look like? And, and tried to gain feedback from, from all of you and, in, and others in the industry, and we got wonderful feedback. In fact, the FAA last year uh, published their version of a ConOps uh, for Advanced Air Mobility, or UAM, and then we just recently, WISC recently published a revision to that to converge on the ideas. So we're working close and closely with uh, partners and regulators to advance the, this concept and get down into the details where we have uh, ultimately, it's as simple as just making sure that these technologies that we've developed down to the hardware and software lines of code have that traceability back to uh, requirements. Every input results in the same output. Contingencies are well, well planned and designed and, uh, and we end up with a pretty, uh, actually simple and elegant solution. Yeah. So l let me push you a little bit on that. So do you believe and does WISC also believe that uh, all of the technology that's necessary for both the, I would say scripted, you know, flight plans, but also for the unscripted parts of it that will require decision making is in hand pretty much? Yeah, by and large, yeah. you know, it's, it's a matter of, of validating mm -hmm. what we already know in yep. the context of this end-to-end -end system and the airspace integration, the airspace uh, you know, air traffic management system that we have in, in place today is, is functional and, and, and very effective in uh, IFR flight plans. So if we can follow that same similar operation and then take the, the functions of the pilot mm -hmm. and make sure that they're captured in the various elements, either whether it's on board or off board, or whether it's traffic surveillance from third-party services 
we're actually working closely with uh, a company, uh, w another JV uh, called SkyGrid, you mentioned in my intro, um, and SkyGrid and, and uh, WISC and other uh, UAM customers are working together to establish what that autonomous concept sure. ought to look like in terms of traffic surveillance and uh, uh, monitoring cooperative and uncooperative uh, uh, air traffic uh, and, and making sure that we have all the appropriate contingencies mm -hmm. and supplementary to our existing um, uh, air traffic system today. So by and large, these, these technologies exist. Of course, there's going to have to be, as we define all the rules and details, sure. uh, potentially uh, d designing uh, bits and pieces around it. But it's, the hard part is ensuring that uh, r highly redundant Mm -hmm. uh, for all critical safety of life functions, that commercial level of safety all the way through, mm -hmm. and piecing all that together in a way that, we, that gives us the confidence that we can make this, and anybody getting on a, uh, an autonomous urban air mobility aircraft has that same level of confidence and that same safety that we do getting on an airline today. Yeah, right. I was going to switch topics, but I think, Ken, you wanted to chime yeah, in. Yeah, from a, from a military, I, I agree yeah. with everything you said. But it's not hard enough, right? You know, uh, you know, from a military perspective, uh, you know, flying in the national airspace, everything's very structured. You have landing aids, you have GPS, you have communications. There's always a, a, a human being to help you resolve, you know, ambiguity just a phone call away. And from the military perspective, you don't have any of those. And and, and so, from a military perspective. You know, not only do I plan on not having GPS and communications, but I actually have a thinking, acting enemy who's trying actively to commute, to confuse, right? You know, the AI. Uh, uh, so it's a much, much, much harder problem. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we we have several programs. You probably saw about a year ago. Uh, the dog fighting robot, and some poor fighter pilot got into the simulator with this robot who beat him five shots in a row, and I, I'm sure he's going to be buying drinks for the rest of his life. Um, you know, th that is now flying in the real world. You know, we are, we are at, at Edwards Air Force Base actually flying those algorithms and taking it to the next level in cooperation with the Air Force. Or the Air Force is actually standing up a squadron of F-16s uh, that can, you know, a kind of like the Tesla self-driving car phones home every night and says, this is what I saw when, when it watches you drive. Uh, so you can watch real fighter pilots flying and record and, 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 and train future algorithms, but then also develop the tactics and, and everything else of flying with a, a robotic wingman. Uh, so it's a, it's a much harder problem. It's also... Uh, uh, important because we want to get the people. You're, you're trying to protect people, and that's fantastic. The way we're trying to protect people is to get them out of the cockpit. Um, you know, when we run war games with a robot aircraft in them, the answer, you know, the results are much better, but the robots tend to die, uh, which is wh why you built them in the first place. No, thanks, Ken, for interjecting yeah. there. So I, I'm going to switch topics and get to Ken, but uh, please notice that the QR code is up there. I know a number of people are already submitting questions, but feel free to submit new questions, but also upvote them so we can get to them in the next few minutes. So Ken, we, we are rapidly uh, approaching the second anniversary of the Ukraine conflict, and we've learned many lessons about flight in sort of the military setting. So. Can you tell us a little bit uh, what, what DARPA thinks and what you think? Yeah, about sure. What are new capabilities, what are important things we've discovered, et cetera, et cetera, that may influence the future of flight? So. Okay, um, yeah, so I, I have a talk I give, and I've got a picture of, you know, Vicksburg in 1863 and, 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 and you know, uh, Verdun in 1917 and Bakhmut last year. And other than being the Bakhmut one being in color, they all look the same, trench warfare. And, and, and my, my punchline is that, you know, kind of life sucks without air superiority. Um, you know, because if, if you can't fly, and what we're seeing in Ukraine, what the military calls uh, A2AD, anti-access area denial, basically surface air missiles and everything. If you can't fly, you're stuck to this attritional ground war. You can't maneuver. You know, if you watch on YouTube or on Twitter, you know, any 
mechanized vehicle that tries to make a move gets rather rapidly blown up by these little quadcopters. Um, and so, you know, we, we had started, you know, the military answer for this for years was stealth. I'm going to be invisible to the radars and sensors that are trying to find me. And there are no stealth airplanes currently flying in, in Ukraine. But stealth isn't magic. And if you get close enough to the radar, he'll eventually see you, right? Um, and and in, in an environment like that where both sides have an anti-access area denial bubble up, anything bigger than about a quadcopter dies. And you're, you're, they're shooting down 30 and 40 of the Iranian Shahid drones every night. Uh, if those were crewed vehicles, those would be like World War II casualty numbers uh, for some of the big, you know, raids. So while you could try to make better stealth, and the United States is, you know, we're always trying to make it better, although what we tend to do now is trying to make it more maintainable, you know, et cetera. Um, you know, you kind of got to embrace the suck and try to deal with it, right? And, and, and so how do you deal with it? Well, one is you can go really fast mm -hmm. uh, and maneuver. Uh, so hypersonics, I know you're a hypersonic guy. The Russians use hypersonic missiles for the first time. Uh, and, and rather surprisingly, they got shot down because they were just kind of going straight, right? And, and so even a Patriot can, can intercept. If I can skate to where the puck's going to be, you know, if you're not maneuvering, right? Um, so the United States, you know, DARPA has done several programs. We had the Tactical Boost Glide program, which was a basically an atmos high atmosphere, you know, Mach 10-ish type airplane uh, glider, though. Uh, we also had what we called the Hawk program, the hypersonic air breathing weapons concept, which became HACM. Uh, so there's the hypersonic cruise missile uh, that the Air Force is building. Uh, that's an air breathing Mach 5-ish type vehicle. And, and in fact, we did so good, and, and they want to see the maneuvering that Congress has, or the De Secretary of Defense asked us to do a little more of Hawk, so we call that Mohawk. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and we're going to, you know, unstart the engine, restart the engine, things that you would never do if you're only going to fly three or four times, but we're having some more flights, so we're going to do that. Um, so, so can I, I'm laughing a little bit because one of the questions that's been upvoted mostly is, what is your favorite DARPA acronym? <laughs> oh. Well, first of all, most of them are acronyms. They're backronyms, right? So you, you figure out the word that you want, and then you kind of try to, you know, come up with letters that make it happen. Um, yeah, Mohawk's a good one. Uh, I, I, I like Mohawk. That sounds um, like a good one. So uh, there are many, many questions on the topic of sustainability. Yeah. So maybe I'll, I'll try to sort of summarize them. And, uh, you know, I think it's mostly directed to you, Rami, but I, I think there's some implications for the military yeah. as well. So, so, you know, we think sustainability is going to play a key role in the future of flight. There's just no question about it. So, so you know, the, the aviation industry, at least the commercial side, is rallying around the 2050 uh, you know, zero emissions or neutral carbon, effectively, goals uh, of various different kinds. So how is Boeing approaching this? And then, Ken, afterwards, you know, what, is this, what does this mean in a different way for the military? So, so maybe... Yeah, thanks, Juan. Actually, uh, if, if, if you could throw up the slide, um, my slide from before, I'd like to reference a couple images from there and actually point to the QR code. I, uh, I think it's, it's really a beautiful thing that our industry has rallied around this goal, that uh, ICAO is... Uh, kind of championing. Mm -hmm. um, we as an entire industry have come together and said, hey, by 2050, we want to get to net zero carbon emissions. And that is, uh, that's not an easy thing to do. That's, uh, that's, and there isn't a silver bullet here. Yeah. Uh, so globally, 2.5% of carbon emissions come from, from aerospace. And, and that is, uh, it may sound like a small number, but it's, it's quite substantial. And uh, it has a risk of growing, that percentage has a risk of growing, because other industries like automotive or heating uh, can make significant impact mm -hmm. um, quickly. And so we, if we're not careful, that number could grow. So we have to really face into it and, and take this 2050 uh, challenge with urgency. Uh, so Boeing's approaching it in a, uh, basically in a four-part strategy. 
uh, I'll just say the four parts and then we'll dive them a little deeper. So fleet renewal, mm -hmm. operational efficiency, renewable energy, and, and new technologies. Uh, from a, a fleet renewal perspective, it's, uh, it's pretty basic. Uh, aircraft, as, as we mature their, their configurations, uh, we, uh, we will design uh, more and more fuel efficient models. So the span, the life cycle of our, of our airplanes uh, can, can span decades. So just modernizing the fleet will have a substantial impact in and of itself. Operational efficiency, uh, it's quite remarkable to see the details of what our airline uh, customers and partners do when it comes to operational efficiencies. The amount of effort that goes into a tenth of a percent mm -hmm. of, of efficiency gains is, uh, is amazing. And now we have digital tools and modeling and, and even uh, machine learning AI technologies that helps us look even uh, deeper into that. So that will continue to be a, a very key part of finding opportunity for uh, carbon emission reduction. Uh, but renewable energy, this is where we talk about like uh, the clean, clean electric or, or clean hydrogen production uh, or biofuels uh, like sustainable aviation fuel. And because our li the life cycle of our, of our aircraft is so long, plugging in a sustainable aviation fuel into our existing fleet by far has the largest impact. Uh, so from an infrastructure perspective, developing, you know, producing massive amounts of SAF so that we could utilize it in our existing fleet has the biggest potential impact and uh, on, on, uh, on uh, our 2050 goal. SAF is a chemically equivalent to jet fuel, but it, it actually requires um, fewer carbon emissions in its production as well as its utilization. Uh, and, then, uh, and then of course new technology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so new technology like what, what's behind me here with, uh, with battery electric, what's gonna, we're gonna learn with uh, this, the infrastructure we have to develop. And of course, from a sustainability perspective, noise uh, emission as well. Uh, we're also doing another program with uh, GE, NASA, and uh, uh, Aurora Flight Sciences on uh, electrified propulsion flight demonstration. Uh, we're, we'll learn about that. The X66, a partnership between uh, NASA and, uh, and Boeing, which I want to highlight the importance of partnerships um, in all of these innovative domains. Uh, the X66 is going to demonstrate a whole host of new sustainable technologies, everything from new aerodynamic configuration at transonic speeds, like you see behind me, uh, through material science and new structures, uh, uh, finite element analysis, uh, as well as even pro new propulsion methods. Uh, the, that system coming together at an airplane level integration is going to teach us a lot. Uh, and and that, that's going to be uh, uh, an amazing program that uh, we just kicked off with NASA, that uh, the culmination of that learning and the net benefits has the potential in, in addition to market analysis, uh, market trends to influence new, new Boeing products. Um, and all of these strategies, if you leaned into one particular strategy more than another, can influence our, our impact on our 2050 goal uh, one way or another. So we actually created this tool in the bottom right called uh, Cascade. It's a, it's a modeling and visualization tool that, uh, that lets you, uh, you can engage with this if you uh, use that QR code. Uh, you can, at the, at the low, higher fidelity levels, lower levels, just use a, a slider bar on all the sub-elements of each of those strategies and uh, and see how it impacts a time-phased approach to, uh, to 2050. So this is something we created for ourselves and our stakeholders to help us know where to lean into uh, more. And, and it's through that uh, and another research that we realized that SAF is, is the big... So you mentioned SAF, and yeah. I, I was going to transition to Ken uh, because there's a question from the audience, which I really like, it, which asks about the most likely route to full-scale production of SAF for both commercial but also for military applications. So I was wondering if there's much work in DARPA or in the DOD that you could comment on, Ken, related to SAF? Well, I mean... Uh, Sustainable aviation. You know, obviously, it's just, I mean, we live on this planet, too, so we, obviously we have a stake in, you know, being able to breathe the air and, you know, not melting. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, from, a, uh, from a military perspective, you know, there's, you know, with the, like the hybrid electric and everything, you know, electric's really good if you're small and... and and you know, if you're very large, it's really hard to beat the energy density of, of mm -hmm. petrochemicals. 
Um, so, uh, but there are other reasons, right? So from, just, just from a few, you know, anything you can do to make an airplane more efficient, is more gasoline you don't have to drag across the Pacific or wherever else, uh, uh, it, and all the logistical element of, of the, because we can't just go to the store or you know, to the gas station and buy some gas, right? Um, so th there's that. Uh, on, the, uh, on the electrical side, there are interesting military applications, whether they be, uh, you know, uh, having a lot of electrical power can be good if I want to put, you know, a, a high power laser uh, on, a, on, on an aircraft or, or a jammer or whatever else. So that we tend to focus more on that aspect uh, of, of this argument, but we will gladly, it would be rude of us not to take advantage of the billions of dollars of investment that the, the commercial folks are doing. I have to say we have to give credit where credit's due. You know, it was the Air Force who began thinking about SAF uh, for yeah. many other transport aircraft for, yeah. for energy security yeah. reasons, let's be clear. But, uh, but that's what got this whole thing going. Yeah. So, um, couple more questions, right, uh, as, as we wrap up this session. But uh, um, I, I like this one a lot, and, and a, a lot of people in the audience think it's important. So I'll, I'll direct it to both of you. Maybe, Ken, you can start if you want. But uh, as we put AI in more of our safety-critical systems and future aircraft uh, platforms, how do you balance verification and validation with cost and security? This is... Who wants to take it? <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll take a crack at it, I guess, you know. Um, we'll start with the verification and validation. Yeah, well, and then there's the other thing that, you know, nobody wants to create Skynet, right? Yeah. You know, from, you know, the Terminator, right? So, uh, you know, we actually are doing what we call ethical, legal, societal implication when we uh, develop a, an AI system. We started doing that, <clears throat> excuse me, with uh, some of the medical stuff we've been doing, you know, like, you know, the, you know, the mRNA vaccine and stuff like that. Um, and, but the idea is, is you know, they're, you know they're, they don't say no, but they make sure you think through what you're doing and, and are actually thinking about the implications and, you know, beyond just the science. Sometimes as engineers and scientists, you get so fixated, it, it's hard to think through like, yeah, but what does that mean, sure. right? So we try to do that. We try not to be evil. Um, uh, as far as validation, you know, I think, you know, <clears throat> you know, there's an, uh, there's a, a, a tale, I don't know if it's true or not, that, you know, when they first started teaching the Teslas how to drive by watching people, the Teslas started breaking all the laws, right, because people, you know, do rolling stops and et cetera, um, excuse me. And so, uh, <clears throat> um, and, I, and I was a flight test guy when I, when, when I was in the Air Force. So uh, the, 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 the problem with AI is, you know, the old school stuff, you explode up into this hyperdimensional space and then try to collapse it down, and so it's very nonlinear. The, the new stuff is, is just, you know, statistical inference, and again, it's very nonlinear. And... and you know, I think the way you analyze a nonlinear system is you find, kind of try to find the island of stability and, and, and kind of hang out there and, and don't go to the edges because it's, it's, it's really hard to predict what's going to happen. That's not a satisfying answer, but I think realistically, yep. you know, that's what we're going to have to do. But I think you're, I think you're spot on. I, you know, uh, I think AI, generative AI, has an is gonna play a significant role in the next generation of engineering development. I think it's gonna play a role in how we do our work and live our lives. I think it's gonna be amazing. Um, but I don't, I don't see a place for that in safety critical systems uh, today or, or in the near future. I think to be, um, to be certifiable, and this is a good thing, every output has to be predictable. And we do that by having a, uh, uh, an end-to-end -end traceability from requirements to output that we can point to and say, when I, when, when I do this, that will happen every time, and it's not going to change. Uh, 
that's critical for safety, safety critical systems, for safety of life systems. So when we get into uh, autonomy, it's not the same as saying generative AI equals autonomy. Autonomy is such a loaded word. In fact, we went through a time where we, we were putting coins in a jar if, if an engineer used autonomy because it's not specific enough. We wanted to just, uh, but it's, it's, you know, AI I think will change how we live and work and it's gonna have applications in driving, very important applications in driving efficiencies and in, in, uh, applications and operations but I don't see generative AI playing a role in, in safety critical autonomy. One thing I forgot to say. Quick. Yeah, quick, I know. Oh, wow, we're out of time. Yeah. Um, you know, one, one, I told you we've got the, uh, the dog fighting robot. We took it out of the simulator and put it into the real airplane now. One of the things you can do is kind of put a hypervisor on top of the autonomy. Yeah. So for instance, we put in all the normal training rules, don't get within 1,000 feet you know, knows right, goes right, all the normal training rules that fighter pilots use. We actually bolted that in on top. And so it's watching what the robot's doing and then say, no, you can't do that. Yeah. So maybe the computer can save us from the computer. Uh, uh, so. Well, I'm afraid we've run out of time, but thank you very much, gentlemen. <clears throat> I would like to remind people that at 10 a.m., there's a Forum 360 panel on the systems view of sustainability for those of you who've asked questions about this, to this topic so we can follow up. Uh, please check out the program and see all the technical sessions and the special sessions that we have today. And on behalf of AIAA, I would like to thank the two speakers and present them with one of the coins here. So thank you.